Welcome back to Coursera. This is lecture 15. Last time we were talking about the specific muscles which were acting to flex at specific joints of each finger. And last time we identified the major joints that are formed in each finger were a knuckle joint, that was a metacarpophalangeal joint, and then a proximal and a distal interphalangeal joint. And we identified the extrinsic flexors and extensors basically at those joints. And we're going to revisit them again in our conversation now because we have to begin to talk about some intrinsic muscles, muscles that start and end within the confines of the hand that also act at these various joints as we will see. So what we identified last time were the major actions that are possible at the metacarpophalangeal or the knuckle joints versus the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints. We said last time that we have the ability to flex and extend our fingers at all three of those joints, but only at the knuckle joints do we also have the capability of moving our fingers in the coronal versus the sagittal plane by finger spreading, by ab and adducting our digits toward or away from a defined axis that passes through the middle of the middle finger. And we certainly defined the actions as abduction by spreading our fingers away from that axis versus adduction being movement of the fingers back to the anatomic position by moving them toward that anatomic axis. Then we can also see that the major muscles that are contributing intrinsically to these actions will be the interosseous muscles that will act as our finger spread muscles and the very interesting lumbrical muscles that we introduced last time that are intrinsic hand muscles named because somebody thought they looked worm-like, lumbrical. These muscles will have some very important actions because as we will see, they will assist the extensor digitorum muscle, a flexor, an extent, a muscle found in the extensor forearm in extending at the interphalangeal joints. So let's look at these muscles. First off, on the left side of this page are the illustrations of the four lumbricals, very important intrinsic hand muscles that actually don't have any bony attachments because the four lumbricals all arise from various sides, mainly the radial side of the four tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus. So as the flexor digitorum profundus crosses the palm of the hand on its way out to attach, as we said, to the bases of each of the four distal phalanges, it picks up a lumbrical. And the lumbricals arise mainly from the radial or the thumb sides of those tendons. And as such, the lumbricals arising from the palm of the hand will cross the anterior or the flexor sides of the knuckle joints but then they sweep around onto the radial side of each finger, the lateral side of each finger, and as we will see, the tendon of each lumbrical blends into and attaches to a slip of the tendon of the extensor digitorum on the other side. So this is why we say that lumbricals have no bony attachments. They arise from flexor digitorum profundus tendons in the palm of the hand, and they attach to extensor digitorum tendons on the dorsal or posterior aspect of the hand. Then the interosseous muscles. Interosseous muscles got their name because they arise and attach to the sides of a corresponding pair of metacarpals, again deeply embedded in the palm of the hand. The Dorsal interosseous muscles are really the ones that have the, the best name because they are literally found between the metacarpals. The palmar interosseous muscles are a little more situated on the anterior sides of three of the metacarpals, and as indicated, they are more anterior than are the dorsal interosseous muscles. But here's their action. Note that we have four dorsal interosseous muscles. We have one that attaches to the first metacarpal. 
we have two that attach to different sides of the metacarpal of the middle finger, and we have a fourth interosseous muscle that attaches to a side of the metacarpal of the, or the, sorry, proximal phalanx of the finger. Now let's look at the dorsal and the palmar interosseous muscles. They are named because they arise largely between the metacarpals in the palm of the hand, and their tendons extend out and attach to the corresponding sides of a proximal phalanx. Putting these muscles in a position to abduct fingers two, three, and four. So we have four dorsal interosseous muscles, but they're only capable of abducting the index finger, abducting the ring finger, or moving the middle finger to either side of that line that passes through it. So what we're going to see is that the pinky and the thumb have their own personal abductors that will give us the power to spread the thumb away from the palm of the hand and abduct the pinky as well. Note that we only have three palmar interosseous muscles. Again, having an attachment largely between or on the anterior aspects of metacarpals and sending their tendons out to attach to a corresponding side of a proximal phalanx. These muscles are in a position to adduct the digits, but they're in a position to adduct the index, the ring, and the pinky. So the interesting point is the dorsal interosseous muscles we always say are the abductors, and the palmar interosseous muscles are the muscles which will adduct the digits. But in reality, the dorsal interosseous muscles that attach to the base of the middle phalanx actually perform both actions because they can pull the middle finger to either side of that midline axis through it, and the dorsal interosseous muscle on the opposite side then acts as the adductor. So this is why we don't have any palmar interosseous muscles attaching to the any part of the middle finger. Okay, so let's summarize this. So we've already said that we have two major long digital flexors that act at various joints, metacarpo, phalangeal, proximal and distal interphalangeal, that's fine. But then we had a single extensor digitorum that we said only was capable of extending at the MP joints. And what we'll see in a moment is the additional role played by the lumbricals based on their anatomy, giving us the ability to extend the interphalangeal joints, both proximally and distally, of all four fingers. Then, note that the extensor digitorum is assisted by two additional extensor muscles that have specific actions on the index finger and the fifth digit. And these are called the extensor indices muscle and the extensor digiti minimi. But again, they're really misnomers because the major action of those two muscles is like that of the extensor digitorum in only giving you the ability to extend your knuckle joints of the index and pinky. Then, the abductors, as we've already indicated, will be the dorsal interosseous muscles and the adductors bringing our fingers back to the anatomic position will be the palmar interosseous muscles. But note, as we said, that the thumb and the pinky need their own personal abductor. You can see the abductor digiti minimi on this chart. And in our next lecture, we'll talk a little bit more about the two abductors that are acting on the thumb, performing a similar action. Now, let's look at a little more detailed picture, a couple of them, of the lumbricals. You can see first off that they are arising, as we said, largely from the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus muscle. And since they are rising on the palmar side of the hand from those tendons, when they cross the knuckle joints or the metacarpophalangeal joints, they will act to flex the fingers at those joints, assisting the other muscles like the flexor digitorum that also cross that joint. But then, as we will see, 
Once the tendons of each lumbricle sweep around on the lateral side of the proximal phalanx, they will blend into and attach to the tendons of the extensor digitorum muscle and form an anatomic structure called the extensor or the dorsal hood, which is merely just an extended portion of each digitorum tendon on that side. Note how the lumbricles are getting their innervation. They share it. Two of the lumbricles that are serving or acting on the index and middle finger are innervated by branches of the median nerve. Two of the lumbricles that are acting on the ring and pinky are innervated by the ulnar nerve. Now let's look at a view of the lumbricles as they attach to an expanded portion of each extensor digitorum tendon. So here in a number of views, first off, like this view, we see a lumbrical arising from a flexor digitorum tendon, profundus tendon on the palmar side. It's sweeping around the lateral side of the proximal inner of the metacarpophalangeal joints. So they act to flex at that joint. But then you can see how the lumbrical tendon is blending into and attaching to the more distal portions of the extensor digitorum tendon, and meaning that it is really the actions of the lumbricals which will act to extend the fingers at the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints because the extensor digitorum tendon is not powerful enough to do that. So we said the extensor digitorum is only powerful enough, despite the name, to extend each finger at the knuckle joint. So in a way, the lumbricals are very important intrinsic hand muscles because we have the ability to put our hand, particularly our fingers, in what we call the lumbrical position, where we can simultaneously flex the fingers at the metacarpophalangeal joints and extend the fingers at the interphalangeal joints. And you do this every day, basically, to perform fine digital movements, and when you spread your fingers ever so slightly using your interosseous muscles, you're typing on your computer keyboard, for example. So certainly the lumbricals are very important intrinsic hand muscles. So going back to the question down at the bottom of the slide, if we said what nerves control extension at the MP versus the IP joints? Extension at the MP or knuckle joints is controlled by the radial nerve innervated extensor digitorum muscle. And it's assisted by the extensor indices and the extensor digiti minimi. But extension of the interphalangeal joints is a role played by the lumbricals by virtue of their sweeping attachment to the so-called extensor or dorsal hood where they have the ability then to pull on the extensor digitorum tendons and really allow those tendons, by virtue of this attachment, to extend all four fingers at the interphalangeal joints. And here you see on, the, on a dorsal view of the hand the location of the extensor digitorum tendons. They stand out fairly prominently. But note, as we've said, even though the tendons go all the way out and have attachments all the way to the distal phalanx they, and cross all the joints of each finger, the major action of the extensor digitorum is simply to extend the metacarpophalangeal or the knuckle joints. So also what, we don't, what you don't realize is that found in the palm and projecting back under the dorsum of the hand between each metacarpal and between the, uh, the extensor digitorum tendons will be interosseous muscles. And the most prominent of the interosseous muscles make up, makes up a huge fleshy component found on the dorsum of the hand between the thumb and the index finger. So when you press that fleshy area between thumb and index finger, you're actually pressing on the fleshy fibers of the first dorsal interosseus, which is a muscle which will give us the ability to abduct our index finger away from the axis through the middle finger. Now then, let's look at those interosseous muscles, because we said we have four of them, 
they're again illustrated here. The interosseous muscles that are dorsal in position are four of them. Their job basically is to abduct the four fingers, but not all four fingers, fingers at the metacarpophalangeal joints. So there is the prominent first dorsal interosseous muscle that forms the bulk of the fleshy part of your hand between the base of the thumb and the index finger. That first dorsal interosseous muscle sweeps out and attaches to the base of the proximal phalanx of the index finger. Interosseous muscles two and three have an attachment to different sides of the, of the proximal phalanx of the middle finger. And the fourth interosseous muscle is simply abducting the ring finger. So the four interosseous muscles allow us to finger spread the middle three fingers. And as we've indicated, but we haven't shown yet, the thumb will have two separate abductors and the pinky will have its own personal abductor as well, giving us the ability to spread those digits at the same time as we spread every other. Then, if we look on the palmar side, we see again the illustration of the three palmar interosseous muscles that give us the ability to adduct the index finger, adduct the ring finger, and adduct the pinky, since the pinky does not have its own personal adductor. But it looks like, and this is a variation, in this particular atlas, it shows the thumb having a palmar interosseous muscle. That's a subject of debate, whether it does or doesn't. Some, argue, some authors argue that it does, some don't. But the real question that comes up is, regardless of whether it's depicted or not, does the thumb actually need a palmar interosseous muscle to adduct it? And the answer will be no, because we'll see on our next slide that the thumb has its own personal adductor, as well as having its own personal two abductors. So the three palmar interosseous muscles merely are adducting, as we say here, index, ring, and middle finger. And all of the interosseous muscles, regardless of whether they are dorsal or palmar, are innervated by branches of the ulnar nerve. So your ability to finger spread and bring your fingers back together is controlled by the deep branch of that ulnar nerve. So here on the next slide is our adductor pollicis muscle. Very broad muscle that has attachments to the third metacarpal and the capitate bone in the wrist and sweeps out basically and gives us the ability to adduct our thumb now but largely by adducting it at several joints, the carpometacarpal joint there and obviously giving us the ability to act also at the metacarpophalangeal joint as well. So this muscle also shares the innervation of all the other interosseous muscles with the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. Now let's consult our digital atlas and this will give us a view of the lumbricals and the interosseous muscles. First off you see again the tendons of the flexor digitorum superficialis and deep to it, the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus, certainly acting, as we've said, to flex at various joints along the length of each finger. But what's also shown in this particular view are examples of the lumbricals. And you can see the lumbricals. I'll pick them out there. There's one. So basically, this is the first lumbrical. There's the second lumbrical. There's the third lumbrical that's there, and the fourth one there. These muscles are acting to flex the fingers at the knuckle joints, metacarpophalangeal joints. And even though you can't really see the illustration here, as we've said, they also blend in with the tendons of each tendon of the extensor digitorum and really are acting to extend the fingers at the interphalangeal joints. Note also in this particular view we can see the interosseous muscles. There's the first dorsal interosseous muscle that's there and the subsequent interosseous muscles, particularly 
the palmar ones are situated deep to the lumbricals and the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus. Then if we extend our view to the posterior side, we again have a view of the lumbrical muscles and we just barely see an example of a lumbrical muscle and not really showing how they are blending into the tendons of the extensor digitorum. What's also shown adjacent to them are several of the interosseous muscles and we don't have a view of how they act to finger spread the dorsal interosseous muscles but the reason they are on this particular picture is that the interosseous muscles assist in extension of the interphalangeal joints by also having a slip that blends into each extensor digitorum tendon. So if I roll this over there, you can see the second dorsal interosseous muscle that's positioned there, the third one, and you can see them situated and attaching to a corresponding side of the proximal phalanx of the middle finger, whereas the first dorsal attached to the index and the fourth dorsal attaching to the proximal phalanx of the fourth finger or the ring finger.